last week for a movie and a dinner. Then we parked on a dead end street. He said, I've got a present for you. I thought my dreams were all coming true. I closed my eyes. And the winner is? The winner is Marjo. I know I was the first direct women director to win an Oscar, which I rarely get credit for. I guess because everyone, you know, discounts the documentary category. I think, you know, maybe I wasn't the first woman director to win for best, you know, uh, director of a dramatic feature, you know, so, and that's the other category. I was also the first woman to wear a tuxedo <laughs> to accept an award. No, it really, I couldn't afford a gown. Tatum O'Neill copied the tux the very next year, I think, when she won for Paper Moon. So she was like, I think, 11 years old, and she was in a tux. She got that from me. <laughs> I never pass a street musician anymore without wondering about their story, and I was hoping when other people saw it that they would feel the same way. When Thoth and I uh, went to the Academy Awards together, he was in his full regalia, and he went up on stage as well with me. Um, and I remember in my speech I did thank security for finally letting him through. <laughs> A common mistake that people make when they write their first screenplay is uh, not to have met the characters, you know, to dive in without having intimate dialogue with their characters. Because once you get to know, you know, everything about them, they become very easy to write and often behave independently. You know, they lead you where they're going. So I had the students, there were various exercises, you know, one of which was to interview your character, you know, and ask all the questions that you would ask someone you wanted to get to know, and also to observe them, the way they sat or moved, you know, um, you know what was in their pocket, uh, you know, how much money was in their wallet or none, you know, um, their health and so forth, and to do it even with the minor characters. I think that it's common in the screenwriting uh, industry for men to write very weak women characters and for women to kind of fall down on the job when it comes to writing men. So to deal with that when I taught uh, advanced screenwriting at Emerson I had them write a scene between a man and a woman and then switch the names and to see that there wasn't a whole lot of difference. The women really to a human extent feel and talk the way men do. It's very equal. That was something I did now and then in my script for Impromptu, which was about the affair between Frederick Chopin and George Sand, a very masculine woman and a very feminine man. And there were a few scenes in there that I wrote and then switched the names so that, you know, George was the man in the scene and, and Fred was the, was the woman. And that worked out very nicely. It is my preferred experience to have as little as possible to work with because then I can make it my own and, you know, make it up myself. It's when something is extremely well known and um, possibly beloved uh, that you get nervous about what you're leaving out and you feel very constrained as far as, you know, making up your own stuff. Um, impromptu was... Uh, a, a minefield also because it was history, uh, historical characters. And I always tell people or students, whatever, that when they are attempting biography or history, that it's, it's, it's not important that it's factual, but it is important that it's true and there, that there is a difference. You can, if it's the same, adds up to the same truth, you can uh, make free with some things in history, you know, you can telescope things or you can even invent a meeting that didn't take place, all in the interest of keeping the dramatic flow going. Um, because when you're just doing 
you know, the key events in somebody's life, it has a, just a very uh, uh, monotonous and um, beautiful uh, treatment. So, and, and that's palpable to an audience. Oh God, that was divine. Well, I just remember going to the set the first day and thinking I sat in a little room, you know, with my laptop. And now hundreds of people are here to do that, you know, that, that all of that came from, you know, my head. So uh, I allow myself that particular ecstasy. You perform a pitch, you don't write it. And I've always been very resentful about that. It's like, why do I have to be a performer too? Isn't it enough? You know, so sometimes I submit treatments, um, which I feel, you know, plead my case better. But it's true though that, that uh, executives respond better to, to verbal pitches. And they want to see you jump up and down on the couch with energy and optimism because they need that. They, they need um, to feel your dedication and your hope and your uh, you know, manic excitement to do this script before they themselves can believe in it. They want to make the right decision. Not only is TV wide open, but the writer is in control, the showrunner at any rate. So, um, that is the opposite. I mean, the writers are in charge in theater, in TV. Why they are not in charge in film is largely because of the, uh, the auteur theory. The nasty man who came up with that forever changed the status of writers uh, in the business. And then add on to that the proprietary screen credit, which means a film by which always goes to the director, is in their contract. It's appalling how often they attribute things to the director that are clearly, you know, the work of the writer. And there are writers, critics, who are perpetuating this. So I, there's no way of getting rid of the proprietary film critic. The directors will never let it go, but it is a scourge. And when I uh, was accorded that credit, uh, a film by Sarah Kernigan. I didn't take it. I insisted to the producers that it should read a film by everyone who worked on it. And that's what you see on screen with my teen comedy called All I Want to Do, um, which I wrote and directed. I don't suffer much from writer's block, but I do understand, you know, people who do. You know, it's mostly fear. Um, and I certainly had it in the beginning. I would call mine more writer's hesitation. I learned that um, the stuff that you wanted to write is already there. That all you have to do is, is kind of stand in the right place in your mind and it would wash through you. And ever since then I've found it very easy to write, uh, no matter how daunting the task is. The only time it becomes difficult uh, and I bog down, it almost always means that I'm going in the wrong direction and I have to go back and see where I made the wrong turn and, and do something differently. And then it flows very well. I can really only name one movie because there's no contest as to the most important influence on me. And I saw it when I was 15 and that was Lawrence of Arabia, which is still to my mind as many times as I've seen it, the most perfect movie in every way. There's nothing that is not superlative in that film. It's flawless. Some 50 years after I saw it, uh, Sundance sent me to Jordan to uh, be one of the mentors in a first screenplay workshop for Arab writers. And there I was in Jordan, and the scenery was all about because the, the, uh, the place where we were staying was in the, in the Bedouin desert. So, and, and I watched the movie again on my iPad twice, you know, just to glory in the fact that it took me 50 years to get here, but I am here. And it's still the most wonderful movie ever made, and there are no women in it. <laughs> what I would most like to see happen when Learning to Drive is released, other than that it be successful and make people feel good, because it's a feel-good movie, uh, is that it helps the Sikh community. Why did I ever think I could drive? I ignore everything and everybody around me. I never learned to cook because I thought my mother would always be there to cook for me. Then there was half a world between us, so I make my own food. Your point? 
No point. I'm learning to drive. You know? Well, that's a scary thought. Shut up! I think it's time to discuss road rage. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life out there. When you are at the wheel of a car, this is all there is. Your life right now.